And welcome to another edition of the Mad Tech webcast. Uh, today I have Zachary Farouk uh, from uh, OneTrust. Zach, how are you? I'm very good this morning. Enjoying yeah. the weather. Thanks very for good. having me. It's great to have you. Uh, today we're talking about privacy trends in media and publishing. And, uh, you know, despite the, uh, the headwinds of COVID and all the rest of it, Privacy has not gone away, and it's a very important topic. And we have Zach on here today to talk through some of the stuff that uh, we're interested in doing, and obviously talking about some really hot uh, issues, particularly they announced by Apple this week uh, around um, around sort of opting in users for tracking and measuring using IDFA. And we will come to that later on, but it is pretty hot. Um, but to start with Zach, um, uh, could you just give us sort of an overview of what uh, one trust is doing right now because obviously you you know you are uh, the number one sort of privacy framework and platform for for the industry uh, and you've raised a ton of money so I'd be interested to know yeah. you know what what's uh, what's going on at one trust what's the what's the grand vision I think really just supporting businesses um, you know helping them navigate the jurisdiction landscape the different regulations that are coming in uh, if we think about GDPR which was probably the big driver. Um, certainly of the growth of, of one trust. Um, but the reality is, I, I can't remember who coined this phrase, uh, but it's a great phrase. The, the GDPR is the EU's most successful export. And it's so true. You know, every other territory, every other country, every other region is now, you know, dropping personal data protection laws um, for their own citizens. So it's, it's, it's a moving target right now. Uh, and really, we're here to help businesses um, from from an end to end perspective. I sit within the publisher team, so specifically work in the publishing industry, supporting on uh, most commonly the CMP side, but also with privacy rights uh, and first party data capture. Yeah. Um, so yeah, really, it's it's all about supporting in in building trust with your consumers uh, and rem- remaining compliant as a business. Okay. So, so obviously, uh, privacy has had a huge impact on the on the sort of uh, the monetization piece for publishers and media owners. And I want to talk about that to start with because obviously that transition from from a world that was reliant on you know uh, opt, uh, no opt in for cookies, but sort of like uh, you see an ad, uh, uh, you get content for free, and you're okay to be targeted and measured uh, accordingly to a world where privacy is front and foremost in terms of legal and sort of, a, um, you know, a social sort of even uh, uh, practice. Um, and I want to talk about that transition. So how are you seeing those publishers and media owners move from that world into a privacy first world and how has that affected their, uh, their sort of monetization? I, I think, you know, reality is it's a, it's a huge challenge um, for publishers. I think if we look at the history, um, and one thing I will call out is that privacy is defined as a human right. So this goes back to 1948 and the Declaration of Human Rights. It's not something that just appeared out of the blue with with GDPR. Um, The challenge has been keeping up with technology. So if we look at the ad ecosystem itself, um, on the web, it probably started about 1994, you know, the claim is that was the, the first banner ad and, and it had a click-through rate of 44%. Wow. I mean, who wouldn't kill for a CTR I mean, of 44%? I mean, that kind of performance would be awesome right now, right? Uh, I know. Can you imagine? Um, and then the ad servers came in because obviously suddenly it was very hard to manage inventory. Where are my banner ads? Whose sites are they on? You know, what are the click-through rates for each of those? And so you saw the likes of DoubleClick, et cetera, coming in. Interestingly, when the IAB was born as well in 1996. Um but, but this, this huge sort of rise in advertising meant a huge drop in CTRs. I think we're at something like 0.06 today from that 44% that we started. I know it's 0.01 for the display. Okay, that's not bad. That's yeah. not bad. It's, it's an improvement on 0.06, the stats that I was looking yeah. at. Um, but so, you know, technology is then trying to improve this. How do we improve this? And we prove it through personalization. If we understand who the user is that we're about to serve that ad to, we've got a much better chance of converting that individual. Um, if I take me as an example, or you know, if, I, if I've just gone to a Mercedes website and I've been looking at, looking at a car, if you show me a Mercedes advert, 
where I'm going to get, you know, 10, 15, 20% off. It's highly likely I'm going to click through on that because I'm going to be interested in it. But if you show me something about chalk paint, uh, and I use that example because my girlfriend used my laptop, she was looking at chalk paint. For two weeks solid, all I could see on YouTube were adverts in regards to chalk paint, um, which, which I just didn't care about. So, you know, how the, the ad industry moved to this personalized approach for a very good reason. And actually, consumers prefer it. We recognize we're going to have to see adverts. We would much rather see adverts that we care about, um, that you know, have the potential to, to pique our interest than, than something that is entirely uh, irrelevant. But then, you know, from a regulatory perspective, that's when the cookie law came in. Um, so all of this personalization is, is you know, 99% of it is done through third-party cookie matching and third-party cookies in that ecosystem. Uh, so the uh, e-privacy directive came in, and most importantly, it was a directive. So uh, it was widely ignored, I think, by the ad tech ecosystem, it's fair to say. Um, it wasn't legislation. It wasn't law. It was just some guidance, basically, for countries that wanted to, to legislate. <clears throat> but then obviously we had we had everyone's favorite four letters come in, in in 2018 with the GDPR, which took a much stronger hold. It was legislation. It was a regulation, not a directive. Uh, and that's really what has sort of exploded um, the focus um, for the ad tech on, on capturing compliant consent. And mm. we saw the introduction of the IAB's Transparency and Consent Framework, version one, uh, and now with the release, uh, the deadline August 15th, uh, for the TCF version two. So that so that's a good that's a good segue for the TCF version two. What is so different um, from the, the version one? Uh, I mean, obviously, version one's been kind of had had its, uh, had its issues, uh, particularly with Google yeah, not taking part in it. Uh, so what's what's so different with version two? Is it more to comply with uh, privacy regulation or just a bit tighter sort of? Um, technology or what's what's the difference yeah so the the major differences is uh, really the increase in purposes and special features and this ties back to the regulation when we think about what is lawful consent you know it has to be unambiguous it has to be uh, informed uh, affirm clear affirmative action so you need to be able to present to the user um, all of the information that they are consenting to what is it that i'm consenting to when i hit this OK button or allow button or confirm my choices button. Um, so they expanded out the list of purposes. Uh, they improved the global vendor list as well, um, gave some publisher overrides to publishers so that you know a vendor that was requesting, um, not requesting consent and was relying on uh, legitimate interests as a legal basis for processing personal data, um, that can be overridden by the publisher. Not something we're going to see anymore with the recent uh, uh, Planet 49 um, uh, result from, from Germany, where they have now, Germany has now decided that, that yes, they need to adhere to capturing valid consent for, for cookies as well. So they throw that legitimate interest argument, which was basically being, being used by cover for by a lot of co uh, companies to say, well, they're on the Correct. site, therefore they must be okay with ads on the site. Yeah. So there are some Nordic countries that you may want to keep that on. So, you know, the, the, they've got special handling for, for purpose one, which is the storage and access of information. Mm. Um, so, yeah, they, they, they really sort of refined it to, to, to be in line as much as possible with GDPR. Because ultimately, that's what the TCF is there for, is to solve the GDPR conundrum for the ad tech ecosystem. Right. So T the TCF2 is, is a tighter sort of framework that allows, that sort of covers over any any cracks that was appearing previously with the first version. Yeah, absolutely. And it, 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 it took feedback from, you know, the ad tech vendors themselves. Uh, obviously, the IAB themselves are, are, are built off of, of uh, ad tech vendors. Um, so capturing the feedback from all the different parties. What did publishers need? Well, they needed publisher overrides. Yeah. And what did the ad tech need? Well, they needed the ability to choose which lawful basis they wanted to apply for. Uh, and they needed more specific purposes based on what they wanted to do with the personal data. Um, so all of that was collated over the two years, and, and, and that's, that's culminated in the TCF version two, which, as you rightly uh, mentioned earlier, Kieran, or alluded to, uh, Google have, have said they're going to be joining. Oh, welcome, Google. Um, yeah. About time you joined the party. Um, do, do, do you just just briefly? Do you, do you think that the um, that the industry is taking the eye off the ball here a little bit with the COVID stuff? 
Because like it doesn't seem to be uh, front of mind as much as it was, um, and I feel that um, you know that maybe the EU's got other things to think about um, right now, and the ICO obviously um, then then sort of like you know auditing cookie activity on web pages. Um, yes and no. I think it depends from supervisory authority to supervisory authority. Uh, we saw the Irish DPC. Um, uh, release guidance uh, a month or two back, so COVID hasn't stopped them. Uh, specifically for ad tech, though, the ICO, yes, absolutely, it has slowed them down. They were doing an investigation specifically on the ad tech ecosystem. That's been pushed back. They we were expecting the ICO to get a have to slash a big fine against them. The rumor rumor mill was was an over overrun or override uh, overdrive. Yeah. Um, that someone in the ecosystem that a company in the ecosystem was going to get really. Uh, going to get a big fine and a big slap on the wrist uh, for for bad activity. It, it, it's going to happen. Uh, I would say, you know, the TCF has now been pushed. The deadline was June 30th. It's been pushed and the dates have been split in two uh, to, excuse me, August the 15th for deprecation of TCS version one, um, no longer being supported. And then September 30th for the version one TC strings to no longer be valid. Um, so, so they have provided publishers more time to come into that. I would say from a trend perspective, um, we're probably in the late majority with TCF version two when we think about web. Uh, mobile is a whole different story, but I think within you know web, digital properties there, um, we're probably getting the late majority now all coming on to, to TCF version two. Good. Good talk about mobile. Let's talk about mobile because this is the exciting yeah, part. Uh, it is the exciting uh, this part. Week, uh, Apple uh, made an, an important announcement at the start of the week that they would be making changes to the ways in which apps uh, use advertising uh, identifiers, and specifically the IDFA identifier in the iPhone ecosystem, right? Yeah. Um, the identifier will require every app to seek permission from every user to track and share their data. Um, it's going to have a big impact in the industry. And we will talk about this. Uh, we're going to get a poll up now because we're going interactive on this thing. Uh, yeah. I, want to, I want to poll our users, um, our viewers. Um, will the changes to IDFA require every app uh, to seek permission from each user to track and share data have a massive impact on our industry? Or A, yes, definitely. No, the industry is already prepared for this. And C, the people who have their head in the sand I'm unsure at the moment, quality. But from a privacy uh, perspective, Zach, this is huge. Um, let's talk about this. Let's unbox this. This is, this is very significant, right? So Apple has decided that it's going to have a hard opt-in for use of the IDFA for tracking, measurement, and targeting, right? But I yep. didn't see anything about uh, uh, complying with CCPA or GDPR on that uh, spec, right? Have Apple open up a Pandora's box for themselves yeah. here because let's let, we're going to talk about mobile here, but we both know that mobile is a free for all on the privacy side, right? Uh, mobile use is up, right? Massively across our apps, gaming, etc., and they're not looking for uh, opt in for privacy. So, has Apple opened up a Pandora's box here for itself? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think they have. So I suppose just as a bit of bit of background for anyone that isn't aware, the IDFA and the IDFV uh, were introduced in iOS six, I, I believe. So they've been around for like seven, eight years. Uh, we're on iOS fourteen, I think. I think now, and you know, they're effectively two different unique identifiers. One, the IDFV, is a unique identifier for the vendor. So who's built the app? Um, that's freely available. There's no consent being requested there. Uh, the IDFA, however. Um, was previously freely available outside of being able to opt out of ad tracking in your phone settings. So if you go into settings, you could limit ad tracking and that would prevent the IDFA being available. Now, what, what Apple are, have now said with this new release is that there is going to be an ex explicit opt-in consent permission that needs to be requested by the app when it's started. Similar to you know the the, the same permissions, you know, whether you're looking at geolocation and access to microphone and all of all of that good stuff. Um, however, I my personal initial reaction 
is is that this has opened Pandora's box, but I think it's done it in a very bad way for Apple <laughs> because all they've done is create a spotlight on them. Um, now, capturing consent for tracking, if you think back to TCF version 1, uh, 2018, the, the Keneal uh, gave Vectory a slap on the wrist, an ad tech lender. Uh, they were using the TCF version 1, um, but the, the suggestion by Keneal, what they were saying, was that that didn't constitute legal consent because it was too broad a scope, i.e. a user wasn't clearly aware of what they were consenting to. Now, by Apple just having this single pop-up that says, we can track you, it doesn't say what vendors are going to yes. be tracking, i.e. Yeah. where is that data being passed? What, what countries is it being passed to? None of this information is captured. It's just a simple yes or no to access to the IDFA. Now, for a standard user, they're not going to understand what that means. They're not going to understand how the ADF, IDFA is used. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, it certainly doesn't constitute, under GDPR, um, lawful consent. Um, because it's, it's not very that, Do you think they realized that when they released that? I mean, surely they would have got some legal sort of guidance on this. Because like, I was sitting there going, okay, they, they've decided that they're going to be the punch bag now for privacy advocates and and uh, um, the uh, you know the uh, data uh, organisations like the ICO and Keneal to investigate them uh, about data use or, and consent, obviously. Um, and, and and it's like mobile mobile seems have got away, kind of got away from from this and haven't really thought yeah. about this. I have a, a few friends in the mobile industry, uh, mobile media companies. And they tell me they're not buttoned up at all. They, they are not getting consent. And they're just waiting for someone to get, get like, you know, whoever's fast is the lion. And the last, you know, the slow guy gets eaten by the lion and the rest of them kind of change, change their tack then. Absolutely. And they, they'll pe press the big red button to activate this. So is, is, there, um, is the, the TCF framework going to incorporate the, uh, the mobile app ecosystem as well? Or, 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 or am I... Because I'm unaware if that was the case, you know, how, how does that work? Yeah, so TCF does cover mobile. Um, it has a very specific framework and API set for both iOS and Android as to how that consent string is passed through the, the ad tech ecosystem. So it 100% covers mobile, um, but to your point, Kieran, the uptake has been very, very slow. So. Um, I mean, I've never, I haven't seen <laughs> I've I haven't not seen one yet. I've not seen uh, uh, you, uh, you know, uh, pop up uh, at all on mobile yeah. app or, or, or request? I, I, I won't say that there are none. There, there definitely are, are some. But again, if we look at that sort of, you know, adoption bell curve, then we're, we're still in the innovators as far as mobile apps concerned. Um, and I, I think if we look at the impact of Apple's decision and what they've done, I think it will bring a focus for publishers on consent and on TCF. And that initial question is going to be, do I still need the TCF if I'm now capturing this consent from Apple? Apple are doing it for me. Um, so there's Apple, going to be a Apple challenge here. Passing, Apple are not passing the strings to, 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 to the, uh, the, um, the vendors, are they? They're not, they're not sending the, they're not using consent strings uh, like, like the TCF framework to say that this user's opted in, it's okay to target them. You know, and when they're audited, they can say, I think Apple's left them op op themselves open to huge uh, legal uh, challenges here because they're now responsible for that, like, because they, they haven't, they haven't abdicated the, the privacy piece. They're like, oh, we're, we're the, we're the last uh, uh, defense against uh, misuse of, of data. Okay. Yeah. But you're just basically a la carte. You just opt in for everything. You know what I mean? Yeah, and, and that's going to be the publisher's argument, isn't it? You know, you, you go back to supervisor or authority comes to you and you said, well, I did to, to the operating system's request was from a privacy perspective. They, they provided consent. They captured consent. I, I did that as I, as I should have. Now, reality is the advice to publishers is that I would provide to publishers is absolutely still place the TCF uh, in your mobile apps if you are going to be serving ads and specifically personalized ads um, because that consent is not lawful consent 
for the use case of ads, despite it, you know, all being reliant on ads ultimately because it's the IDFA. It's the ID for advertisers. Um, there's going to be a pop-up and a pop-up uh, for users, like, you know what I mean? Exactly. We're it's a, a horrendous customer experience. One type thing, you know? Yeah, I, I, I would have rather seen Apple, um, you know, build in to the operating system, checking for the TC string for any company serving ads. Uh, and they've got the... Um, SK ad network now. So they're going to be much more aware they're getting or, you know, ad networks to sign up to their ad network. Um, yeah. What, what's the, just, just so our, our, uh, our viewers uh, know with the SCA network, I mean, obviously let's be honest, it's not to do with SCA music whatsoever. No. Uh, uh, you know, uh, it's not, uh, unfortunately, no, it's not at all. Um, so what, what, what exactly uh, is it? So it, it, it's not there to pass any personal data. It's really there just so that you can get information in regards to conversions. So if you as an advertiser place your app in you know, uh, another app, you want to be able to track when which app has... Um, so probably a better way to explain this. I'm an advertiser uh, and I'm putting my advert for my app out to five different other apps. Now, when someone converts in one of those apps, uh, i.e. goes to the app store, clicks the ad, downloads the app, logs in, it's useful for me to know, as the advertiser, which app resulted in that conversion. So it's because obviously that's where I'm going to focus. It's just an, a, a, an attribution model that, or an app, attribution tool that they've built for it, their ecosystem. It is, but I, I think it's going to be a lot more than that long term. I think this is a... Get all the ad networks to sign up to our ad network, and then let's take over the market. Let's kick all the ad networks out. Yeah, start charging. Interesting. Uh, okay. So, so talk about what you guys are doing in the mobile space, because obviously with this, it, I think yeah. this is going to alert a lot of apps across the ecosystem that Apple's basically shining on, you know, a light on us. Well, thank you, Apple. Um, yeah. That we're going to have to get uh, buttoned up on the privacy front. So what, what, how do you work with these apps yourselves? Yeah, so we, we provide a CMP um, that is both web and mobile compliant. So for the transparency and consent framework, the, the IAB hold a list of compliant uh, consent management providers, uh, and that's separated out across CMPs for web uh, and CMPs for mobile. So we're, we're certified for both web and mobile mm. uh, and can support with you know, implementing a, a TCF2 compliant banner um, in, a, in a very short space of time. Okay. So. And what about the uptake from the, those apps then? Are they, are, they, are they kicking in your door or, or, not, or not doing that at all? Uh, or is it kind of a slow, a slow burn? Uh, it, it's a slow burner. As, as I say, I think the mobile space, we're, we're starting to see more now. Uh, mm -hmm. And we're starting to see that, I think not from the publishers themselves, mm -hmm. but via pressure from the ad tech industry. Right. So it, the ad tech industry have all signed up to the GVL now. They've gone through all of this work. They're consuming with uh, transparency and consent string. They're passing it downstream. They need consent in mobile. So they're the ones that are now asking publishers to provide that TC string in mobile as well. You think the pressure will come from the monetization engine, like the Googles and the bigger, the bigger ET, uh, ad tech companies going, you have to get this sorted out? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Interesting. So we, we spoke about... Um, CTV uh, previously, uh, it, um, it seems to be a, a hot area for um, for privacy too. Um, I mean, obviously, yeah. money money is now flowing into CTV uh, because terrestrial is getting hammered, and obviously, you you know, um, consumption habits are changing. Uh, we're, we're changing before COVID, and COVID has accelerated that. So, CTV is now you know a hot area for for spend, but again, probably lacking on the privacy front. So uh, let's uh, talk about that, uh, you know, briefly. Uh, talk about sort of what you're seeing in the CTV space. Um, a, a, a lot of questions. Um, we're, in, in some respects, seeing uh, more companies approach us requesting support in CMPs for CTV uh, than we are for mobile at the moment. Um, it, it is a very, very hot topic, as you say. The, the challenge with CTV, and, and one thing I would say is that the TCF, itself doesn't cover CTV. Oh, really? Um, so oh, it's not okay. specifically got a framework in place for CTV. Right. Um, 
but then again, you've got the same ad tech players that are, you know, consuming TC strings in, in web and mobile now. So they want to consume them and keep that consistency uh, for, for CTV. Is, is CTV a bit more complicated or is it, is, is, I mean, given the fact there's so many different, different players in that space, is, is it a, a bit more complex yeah. on how you, you, uh, you can have, uh, you know, um, get yeah. you to opt in and pass that consent string through to the buyers and sellers? Oh, sorry, the buyers, specifically not the sellers. Yeah, it is. And I, I think it slightly changes the responsibility of, of um, you know, reading and passing the TC string. Uh, and that's because of the, the, it's a much more complex landscape. There are, there are many more players. If we think about mobile, for instance, you've got iOS and Android. Windows yeah. isn't really a thing anymore. Um, and Huawei are going to be forced to have their own operating system. So yeah, I mean, you know, that will slowly... We could do a whole webcast on uh, yeah. Marvel's uh, yeah. an ad tech ecosystem. That's going to be amazing. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, sorry, sorry, continue there. It's been an interesting privacy conversation as well. Yeah. Um, uh, whereas when we think about CTV, um, you know, LG use WebOS. Samsung use Tizen. Both yeah. of those are built on HTML, JS. So, so actually you can take the web um, web banner and pretty much yeah. drag and drop it into them. Um, but then you've got Android TV that you need to support. You've got Apple TV that you need to support. Roku has its own bright script that you need to support. So all, there are so many more operating systems and players in the game that it becomes a much more challenging implementation process because you, you have to support all of these different devices. So as a company, are you building tools to kind of connect all that frag because like it is it is it the most fragmented of, of all the ecosystems you see because obviously in mobile you've got two operating systems uh you know on on uh it's web based or you know just browsers you have to think about but in the ctv space it's, it's it sounds like it's a fragmented mess so are you building sure. tools to walk around that yeah we are so we're doing that in a number of ways uh, one is supporting from a sort of headless sdk perspective i.e. You know, give developers and publishers the ability to build their own front ends, but have access to the, to the power of the, the TC string and, and the encoding of that and the global vendor list and all of those different pieces available out of the box in an SDK from OneTrust. Yeah. Um, so that you can just go away and, and build that UI yourself. Then in, in, at the same time, so, so for, for those you know, more mature companies within the space that have their own dev teams, uh, that, that's what's going to fit them. Um, yeah. But then we're also, you know, in parallel to that, working on out-of-the-box UIs that you can effectively drag and drop. So if you're a smaller business um, or you're, you know, just trying to get to the deadline of August the 15th because you want to implement TCF due to pressure from the ad tech ecosystem, yeah. um, then, you know, out-of-the-box out ways that you can literally drag and drop, add it into your tool, um, and and be compliant from there. The yeah. the other the other side we're seeing growth in and, and where we're trying to work with uh, is with partners. So there there are quite a few companies, and I won't call out any names, so I don't get in trouble with with anyone else. Um, where you can effectively provide your contact uh, content to them as a software as a service, and they will deploy across all of the different operating systems and devices. And so we're looking to work with them as well to make it much easier for those smaller content um, publishers uh, that, that want to use the power of, you know, those. You mean like, so like WordPress or, or some of those bigger CMSs that kind of have a framework that work with um, web-based publishers? Yeah, um, web publishers probably, um, so WordPress probably not specifically, but the, there are some companies out there at the moment that are providing sort of software as a service you add your content, you build your UI, yeah. and we'll automatically deploy that content oh, to yeah. web, to Roku, yeah. um, to you know LG, to Samsung, to Android TV, to Apple TV, uh, and and take take all of that front end UI work yeah. uh, away from you. Okay, interesting. Um, I think we've got we've more or less run out of time. But just briefly, oh, gosh, Matt, what, what what are you seeing? What do you what's what's sort of the what's hot on your on your radar right now? I mean, obviously we talked about mobile and CTV, but what what's uh, what's going to be sort of on your on your front of mind uh, in the coming months? Uh, I, I think the other big hot topic right now for us is gaming. Um, obviously, everybody's playing games, Zach. Everyone I'm, is playing games. When I get off this webcast, I'm going to play. 
Uh, yeah, years. absolutely. You know, the, the, the days of it being just, you know, for kids and teenagers are long gone. You'll sit on a train and you'll see, you know, the businessman next to you that's 50 years old sitting there playing Candy Crush Saga. Yeah. Um, so gaming is is a big deal now. Uh, and and the free-to-play model, you know, the advertising model of yeah. generating revenue um, is enormous. Yeah. And they uh, need privacy. They need a privacy framework and a privacy uh, technology. And they need to talk to Zach, obviously. Absolutely. <laughs> so um, we're, we're out of time. Do we have the answers to our poll? Because if not, yeah, I'm, I'm canceling democracy forever. I'm like, Donald Trump <laughs> here. Oh, look to see. The poll oh. numbers are up here. And we have... 65% said yes, 10% said no, and 26% said I'm unsure. Okay. <laughs> so the independent voters are always the ones that never know what's going on. Anyway, uh, thank you, uh, Zach. Thank you for your time today. And uh, thank viewers, you. thank you. And uh, that was the uh, Mad Tech webcast. And I will see you again soon. And take care out right there. Stay safe. One meter, one meter, 4th of July. When you go for pints, Stay one meter away, okay? Thank you all.